Welcome to this webinar about the possibly world's first autonomous mobile eye tracking study. Um, before we start with the webinar, I just want to give you a few organizational uh, tips. Uh, this webinar will be recorded, so there's the possibility to also watch it afterwards. Um, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to ask them in the chat. Um, I have about 10 minutes in the end to reserve for Q&A. If you have more detailed questions regarding the study, uh, the methodology, you're welcome to send me an email after the webinar. About me, my name is Daniel Sheffold. Um, I have a background in, in business management, worked um, with qualitative research in that area. Um, I was the project manager, manager for the study here at Toby Pro Insight Services. Um, I'm also a certified trainer for our um, eye tracking systems, the remote side and also the glasses too. And I'm based in Stockholm. Um, and I want to start this case study with a quick video. Uh, what you will see is a short video about uh, a workshop that some teenagers did based on our eye tracking study together with the German Reading Foundation. So this is about communication. And in the background, you see uh, our eye tracking videos and in the foreground one of the teenagers giving a bit of context. Okay, so this is a very brief overview for the ones who have never seen eye tracking before, just so you get an idea how does an eye tracking video look like. So what we saw is the the video stream from the field of view camera and that red circle in the middle was the gaze point. Um, my agenda for today, I want to give a quick overview of the study. Then I will uh, talk about current limitations in observational research, um, why eye tracking makes sense and how eye tracking also complements other um, ethnographic research methods. We'll talk about the methodology of this study and also give an outlook. Um, so in about March uh, this year, the, the German Reading Foundation, uh, the Stiftung Lesen, approached us with a research question. Um, they wanted to know how young people nowadays interact with media, how they read and write in their daily lives. Um, and they wanted to have a very specific study. They wanted to have it as close to real life as possible. So they wanted an observational study, but without observer. Um, so they contacted us from Toby Pro and the Insight Services team and wanted to do this ethnographic eye tracking study. Um, it was a pilot study, it was uh, explorative, so it was um, not task specific, it was not positivistic. Um, it was purely to get a unique insight into the daily lives of uh, young people in Germany. Um, and the results were presented two weeks ago at the Congress Jurnat uh, in Hamburg, which was held by the DIFSI Institute. Yeah, so let's take a step back and look at uh, current limitations of, of observational research. Um, I want to point out three specific limitations. Uh, the, the first limitation is that it's often difficult to capture real life behavior um, in observational research. Why is that? Um, if it's overt, so if you have an, an observer that is watching your participant, um, it will influence the participant and they will likely behave differently as they would in the real world. If it's covered, um, so um, for example, if they observe themselves, they might not reflect the uh, things as they actually are. 
Um, a second limitation or a challenge in observational research is that it's expensive. Um, you need field workers. It's often uh, a lot of time that you need to spend in the field and these pe people need to be skilled so it takes um, a lot of resources. And a third limitation in observational research is uh, that you have an observer bias. Every observer is influenced by their own upbringing, by their own environment, their own experiences, and the, the way they observe will always be subjective and influenced by that. Um, so these are typical limitations in observational research um, if it comes to observers. Um, there's, of course, other research methods such as questionnaire self-observation, self but they also have significant limitations. And I want to give you one example. Um, imagine um, I have um, meet my friend and he's been uh, going out last night. Um, and I ask him, how many beer did you drink last night? Um, he will probably tell me I drank two beer last night. What he actually thinks is I drank five beer. Um, but if I look at, at his receipt and actually see what he drank, I see he drank 10 beer. So there's a discrepancy between what people say, what people think, and what people do. Um, so it's a challenge for most research methods that it's very difficult to measure what people actually do. Um, and that it's not influenced by the way that they want to be seen um, by their friends, by their family, towards society and such. Um, so how does eye tracking come into play here? Eye tracking has some unique advantages that actually meets those kind of, of limitations. Um, so for one, you're having a passive data collection, so there's uh, no observer, but uh, when you wear those glasses, it's just recorded without a person being close. It's unobtrusive, um, so the, the persons feel um, less controlled and they act much closer to real life as uh, with other research methods. Um, it's objective data, there's no observer bias, and it's quantifiable, so we can actually measure certain metrics and it's possible to aggregate data. Um, so when the German Reading Foundation approached us regarding this eye tracking study, we said, okay, let's let's push the limits. Let's make this the, the most unobtrusive, the most uh, autonomous eye tracking study that's possible. So we designed an autonomous mobile eye tracking study where the participants collected the data themselves. Um, and for the ones who already know eye tracking, this is uh, huge. Because so far, there has always, there was always a need for uh, a person that's uh, skilled in eye tracking methods and also in the eye tracking technology to be able to uh, do the data collection. Um, but with the, the latest changes in technology, with the latest trends, we now can hand over the tools to the participants to do the data collection themselves. So in this case, together with the German Reading Foundation, what we did is we gave the four participants each a pair of Toby glasses too, um, and also did the group discussion afterwards. Um, and the participants got one hour of training. Um, so they learned how to turn on the glasses, they learned how to calibrate themselves, how to start a recording, how to stop a recording. Um, and then we sent them out for two days doing the data collection themselves. Um, the data that we coded, uh, we did behavioral coding, so we didn't code fixations and typical eye tracking metrics, but we coded the actual behavior of the participants and for that we used Noldos Observer. 
Um, and then for me, uh, something really important happened because I was the one who was in our Frankfurt office. I was sitting there and I was the, the support staff on call basically. So all the participants had my phone number and I was sitting there and waiting for them to call because I thought they, they probably have a lot of problems um, since nobody has ever done that before. Um, and for me, the amazing thing that happened is I received only two support calls. So over a span of two days, four participants, I only received two calls from them in total. Um, one was an issue with calibration in the sun, which could be fixed easily. And the other one wasn't even related to eye tracking or to our equipment, but the participant was uh, locked on to the wrong Wi-Fi. Um, the result, we collected 28 hours of eye tracking videos with single recordings up to two hours. Um, and the participants, they were completely free to roam. So it was all kinds of environments. They were at home with their friends and family, um, reading, playing computer games, shopping online. They uh, took their car into um, the gas station. They've been uh, in, the, in the city, in the shopping mall. Uh, they were outside playing basketball, playing beach volleyball, walking the dog. Uh, so a very, very wide array of different environments. Um, and as I said, there was no field worker present. So we didn't have any person on the ground helping those participants directly or being close to them. They were handed the glasses on a Tuesday and brought them back on a Friday afternoon without having any uh, person from Toby Pro Insight Services or the German Reading Foundation close. Um, and this is big for us. For, for us, um, it really means that eye tracking is finally ready for the real world. So the, the technology has a stage where it's not a limitation anymore as you see it in many research papers nowadays, but it's actually a new possibility and it's an enabler. Um, so we can finally do new types of studies. We can do ethnographic research without an observer. Um, and we're also decreasing the, the costs and resources needed for eye tracking studies. So particularly if it comes to the data collection, you can now go out, um, give your participants the, the eye tracking equipment themselves, and they do the data collection for you. You don't need to train your own people. You don't need to build up a big eye tracking competence center in-house. Um, and the technology is uh, robust enough to, to withstand even that uh, participants are only trained for one hour. Um, so that's big for us. Um, but of course, you, you could ask, uh, isn't this also possible without eye tracking? Um, isn't that the very fair question? And, and I think it is. Um, I think that quite a few parts of the study would actually have also been able to do just with uh, like a head camera a field of vision camera strapped to the head of the participants, they could probably collect equally as much data. Um, and you could also see behavior. But there's a few things that you can only observe with eye tracking if it comes to visual attention. And I want to show you one example here. Um, and that is an example of uh, media multitasking. So I'm going to show you a clip that is from the study. So it's a recording from one of the participants and you will see her sitting uh, in her home, in her living room, and she's um, having her laptop in front of her, talking to a friend on the phone and the, it's on speaker, the call. So we hear her in the conversation with her friend on the phone, and we see her at the same time watching TV. And you will see 
how um, the the gaze is um, always changing between the different uh, media types. Yeah, so this was one clip from the study. It was a bit dark because she didn't have any lights on in the room, but you can still see quite a lot. And I now want to look with you together at the coded data. So what you see here is the visualization of the coded behavior of this video. So on the left side, we see the different uh, type of media. So we have smartphone, TV and computer and within the different media you see the different behavior so for example on the smartphone calling on the TV watching TV and on the computer Facebook uh, computer behavior and a sub behavior reading social media so what is it that we can um, see from this graph the first is um, we can see here a dominant um, auditive behavior and that's something we coded in the data so during the time of the phone call we actually coded that behavior phone call so from second 300 to about 2000 we see that she's actively engaged in that phone call um, and a second type of behavior that we see is the visual attention and we see here, so the bars represent where her gaze is. And we see how her gaze is um, from about second 250 to 800, how it's constantly changing between the laptop and the TV. So we see how she's jumping back and forth in her viewing behavior. Um, why is this significant? This is significant because we can observe, finally, media multitasking. Um, so for everybody who's, for example, studying um, or is interested in viewing behavior or um, time of uh, uh, commercials shown on TV, you would, with, with other research methods, you would probably ask, how much TV do you watch per day? Or they would have some kind of recorder where it records when the TV is on and which channel is uh, on. Um, but as you can see here, that just because the TV is on doesn't mean they are looking at it. We can actually see with the eye tracking data um, at what share they are looking at the TV of this period of time. Um, so this is just one example what's possible with eye tracking and it's actually kind of a side effect side result of this study um, but i think it's uh, very nice to to observe in this context there's of course limitations um, so as with other types of qualitative research it's difficult to generalize um, for uh, the whole day of the participant but as also for the whole population um, it's uh, very close to real life but there's of course still a bias left so the participants at least know subconsciously that they are eye tracked um, but it's already much better than before and it's probably better than with many other research methods um, and the third limitation specifically for this study is that um, some behaviors could not be recorded, which has to do with data protection laws in Germany. Uh, for example, we were not allowed to record uh, in schools. 
and then we also didn't want the participants to record private private or sensitive behavior such as a doctor's appointment. Um, so what was the role of Toby Pro Insight Services in this project? Um, Toby Pro Insight Services is um, a full service provider for eye tracking. So we did the study design together with the German Reading Foundation. We did the data collection. We handled the equipment and the support. We provided the coding scheme and also coded those 28 hours of uh, eye tracking data with um, an Otis Observer. And we visualized the data and created video selections based on themes. So for example, one 15 minute video with uh, just clips from social media. Um, yes, and Toby Pro Insight Services uh, acts in that case as a research partner and we can combine eye tracking with ethnographic research and we use the best tools available on the market not just the products the hardware and software that is available from Toby Pro. Um, we're almost at the end of this webinar um, what are the the key points that I want you to, to take with you today uh, one is the technology is finally here. Um, we're at a stage where it's not limiting you anymore in your research, but it actually enables you to do research. Um, eye checking can be easy, um, so don't be afraid of eye checking metrics. You don't always need to do statistical analysis and large quantitative studies. Um, you can do very small qualitative research with eye tracking and you will get great and unique insights. And the third one is that um, eye tracking is really going in more and more fields. So ethnographic studies is, is one new field for us and there's more and more coming because the technology is getting easier to use. Um, so my question to you is, uh, what vision do you have for your studies? Um, and that's also my opening point for the discussion. If you have any questions, uh, feel free to just post them in the chat to the entire audience. If you have a very specific question, you can also uh, send them directly to me via email after the webinar. Are there any questions? Okay, it seems like we don't have any questions right now. Um, yes, then I just want to say let's stay in touch. If you want to learn more about the offerings uh, of Toby Pro Insight Services for your research, for your type of studies, uh, or if you want to learn more about the possibilities of eye tracking, you can contact me directly or go to our homepage. You also find me on LinkedIn and are welcome to connect with me. Um, I'm happy to discuss yeah, possibilities of eye tracking with you or also forward you to the right persons. Okay. Thank you so much for your attendance and I wish you all a great day.